the inspection report was just sent back to you. You open it up, you see 30 to 60 pages of a bunch of red letters, a bunch of pictures of things that are broken, and now you're starting to freak out. What do you do next? Hi, I'm Josh Alexander from The Brokerage and your host of Orange County Housing Market News, your one-stop shop for all things Orange County real estate. So in today's episode, I'm actually gonna be starting a new series on how to buy a home in California. So today we're gonna to be talking about once you get that inspection report back, how do you look at it? How do you analyze it? And what are the next steps you need to take to move forward to continue through escrow? So let's go ahead and get into it. So kind of like I alluded to at the beginning of this episode, getting an inspection report back can be a very intimidating and a very scary process, especially if you're a first time home buyer who's never seen one of these before. They're typically going to be 30, 40, 50, 60 pages long, have a bunch of red sentences on it, pictures of everything wrong with the house. And in general, it's going to make it look like that house that you've fallen in love with is just completely falling apart. Well, guess what? That's exactly what the inspector's job is. They need to go through there with a fine tooth comb and find everything they can wrong with the property. Whether that's that the air conditioning doesn't work or that a hinge needs to be tightened on the door to make it close correctly, they're pointing out everything they can about the property that could potentially be an issue for you if you take ownership of the home. Now, are the inspectors going to be able to catch 100% of the things wrong with the home every single time? No, it's unrealistic to expect that. They can't look through walls. Yes, they do have moisture meters and heat guns to give them a little bit of an insight to certain areas, but in general, they're not gonna be able to rip the house down to the studs and figure out everything wrong with the property. But what I like to compare it to is like getting a physical. Are they gonna do every single test on you every time you go in to get a physical? No, they're just gonna go through and make sure that you're generally in good health and that there's no red flags popping up. That's typically what the inspector's job is going to be. So when you get that report back, understand that yes, that's gonna cover the majority of it, but it might not catch everything. So now let's go ahead and look at some of the ways that you can help reduce the income anxiety and stress around these inspection reports. So number one, and this is something that I do with every single buyer that I work with, is your agent should be going through all this information up front with you before you ever get into escrow. They should be explaining an inspection report, showing you a sample one, and then going through everything that I'm about to go through with you right now before you get into escrow, because that's going to eliminate a lot of the surprises and shock that's going to happen when you get that inspection report back if you haven't been prepped to understand what it looks like. And the second thing that needs to happen before you get that inspection report back is if you hire a good inspector, they should be walking through all of the major things that they find at the actual inspection with you at the house. So if you have questions about it, you can ask them on the property, they can explain it, point it out, and that way before you even get the report back, you have a general understanding of what to expect in those reports. So those two things alone should dramatically help reduce that anxiety and that stress about getting that inspection report back. Your agent should already tell you what to expect, show you a sample, and your inspector should be walking you through all the major red flags on the property before they send that report over to you. So when that report gets into your inbox, there aren't going to be any major surprises. But once you actually have that report, how do you break it down to make it simple to understand and really prep you for the next step, which is going to be what to do about it when you're trying to negotiate with the seller? So the way that I typically go through these reports with buyers is we go line by line through every single page of the report and we put everything into four different buckets. And this will help us really categorize everything, make it a little bit cleaner, and then give us a better understanding of how we wanna move forward when we are negotiating with the seller to maybe fix some of these things. So let's go over those buckets now. So bucket number one is going to be anything that has to do with the health and safety of you and your family living in the property. So for example, let's say you have a live electrical wire hanging out of the wall somewhere that if someone touched it, they'd be electrocuted. Or maybe you're buying a home on a raised foundation, there's a few posts missing underneath. You can see that the floor is buckling and it could collapse at any minute. Those are the type of things that you're gonna put in that first bucket that are gonna be health and safety related issues. Now let's move to bucket number two. So bucket number two is going to be for any major functionality issues with the main systems in your house. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's say that the air conditioning is blowing air, but it's not blowing cold air. That's a major system in your house. 
let's say that you go to every single bathroom and every single time the drain is backing up. There's most likely a major plumbing issue with your property. Or the inspector goes through and tests every outlet in the house and 50% or more of them have some type of issue with them, then you're most likely gonna have a major system issue with your electrical wiring in the house as well. So those are the type of things that are go in that second bucket. They're not necessarily gonna be an immediate health and safety issue, but it's a major functionality issue and it could cost a lot of money to fix. So now let's go ahead and look at bucket number three. So bucket number three is typically where the majority of everything in this home inspection report is going to fall into. It's not going to be something that's going to impact the whole house like that major functionality bucket number two, but it's something that typically impacts maybe one room at a time and generally someone that's either a handyman or a contractor will be able to go through in an hour or two and fix these problems. So some examples of these will be, let's say that you have one leaky faucet out of the entire house. Most likely it's not the entire house's plumbing issue, it's going to be isolated to that single faucet. Same thing goes with electrical. Maybe you have one bad outlet in the house, an electrician can go in, fix the outlet, replace it, rewire it. Again, it's not going to be a significant expense. However, it is something that is wrong with the property. So there's really two main reasons why you see the majority of things that are on the inspection report fall into this third category. So reason number one has to do with home maintenance. Home maintenance is very time consuming. It takes a lot of effort to be able to go through every system in the house, keeping it working properly all the time. Yes, there are some homeowners that do a better job than others at keeping their house updated, but most homeowners do not maintain their entire house exactly how they're supposed to. And eventually over time, these smaller problems do arise and the homeowner just ends up living with it because it's just not worth it to them to get it fixed or it's not that big of an inconvenience to leave it how it is. That's one of the main reasons you see a lot of these things end up in that bucket. The second reason is that if homeowners do a lot of DIY or if they hire people that aren't licensed to go through and do some updates on their house, typically that's where these type of issues pop up. So for example, one of the most common ones that I see for anyone that has an attic is as soon as the inspector goes up there, peeks their head up in the attic, as soon as they look at some of the electrical wire in the attic, typically you're gonna find areas where wires were ran together, spliced, but not put in the right junction box to prevent any issues in the attic in the future. Junction boxes cost less than a dollar at Home Depot. An electrician could get in and out of there in 15 minutes or less. It's not a major issue, but these are the things that tend to add up. And that's why you see so many of these fall into that third category. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into the last category, category number four. So this is really having to do with more of the cosmetic side of things in the house. So let's say there's a bunch of scuffs on the paint from people walking through over the years, hitting things against it, or let's say maybe one of the baseboards in the house was chewed up by a dog and it was never replaced. Does it affect the function out of the house? Probably not. Does it affect the appearance? Yes. But those are the type of things that are gonna go into that fourth category. So as a buyer, you've gone through the report with your agent, you've put everything into these four different buckets, now what? Well, now typically is when you're gonna have any secondary inspections done. So what is a secondary inspection? Well, when you have that general inspection done, again, it's a general inspection. So if the inspector finds a bunch of issues that seem to be all concentrating on one system, let's say plumbing, for instance, they're probably going to put in the report, they recommend you getting a plumber out to the property to look and diagnose all these issues that the inspector has found. And this is important because the plumber is gonna give you a better idea of what the actual issue could be. On top of that, they'll tend to be able to give you maybe a price range of how costly it will be for you to get that fixed. And that information is great to have and it helps you negotiate later on when you're talking to the seller, trying to get some of these issues taken care of. So in Orange County specifically, one of the most common secondary inspections that I recommend for a lot of buyers right now is to have a sewer line inspection. And the reason being is that a lot of homes in Orange County are starting to get older. And a lot of them were built with cast iron plumbing. And that plumbing has started to corrode, causing a bunch of plumbing issues on a lot of these houses in Orange County. So what the sewer line inspection does is it puts a camera down that sewer line and to just make sure that the line is in good condition, there's no leaks, there's no roots going through it. And that way you know that when you move in, you're not gonna all of a sudden have sewage backing up into your shower, into your bathtub, into your sink, and then causing thousands of dollars of damage. 
So those are the type of inspections that, again, the general inspector will probably recommend based on the condition of the home that you're going to typically want to have done. Now, yes, this will be an additional cost to you as a buyer, and you won't be able to get this money back because it's a service that's been performed if you decide to back out of escrow later. But it's very important to be able to know this information so you know what you're getting into financially and what problems you might have if you move into the property without getting those problems addressed. So now you've gone through the entire inspection report with your agent. You've broken everything down in those four categories. You've had any secondary inspections you want done completed. Now you're ready to move on to the next step and that's negotiating with the seller on what needs to be fixed in order for you to feel comfortable purchasing the property. And that form that you use is going to be called a repair request. So there's really three different ways you can approach the repair request with the seller. Two of them are very common, one not so much, but we'll go over all three of them. So the first way is that you're asking the seller to fix something during escrow before escrow closes. So if the AC is not working, if there's a leak somewhere, you're going to put on the repair request that the seller needs to hire a contractor get that leak fixed, get everything repaired before you agree to close escrow. The second way to do it is going to be to ask for a credit. So let's say that you went through, you had a secondary inspection done, the plumber told you it was going to be $7,500 to get the stuff taken care of. You can then go on that repair request and say, seller, I would like you to credit me $7,500 because the plumber told me this is how much it's going to cost to get it fixed at the end of escrow. So I can take that money and fix it on my own time once escrow closes. And then the third way, which again is not very common but can still happen, is that you can ask the seller to reduce the purchase price. So if you're getting a loan on the property, this typically doesn't make much sense because reducing the purchase price, let's say by $10,000, is not really going to impact impact your monthly payments that significantly. It's typically more beneficial to have that money up front so you can get the issue taken care of without having to spend $10,000 more of your own money after everything is said and done once escrow closes. So those are the three different ways you can use the repair request to try to get some of these issues taken care of. But now how do you know what's reasonable to put on that repair request and ask the seller to take care of? Well, unfortunately, a lot of this has to come down to the type of market you're in. So if you're in a hot seller's market like we have been over the last couple years, it's typically going to be harder for you to ask for more and more things for them to fix because look at it through the seller's eyes. If you're a seller, you go into escrow with the buyer and they say, I want everything on this inspection report taken care of before I feel comfortable buying this home. They're going to be thinking, I had seven, eight, nine, ten 10 offers on this house lined up behind yours. Odds are I could probably find a buyer that's going to be less demanding with the inspection report. So I'm really not going to entertain this. I'm just going to drop out of escrow. I'm going to go find a new buyer. And the probability is they're going to ask for less on the inspection report, ultimately netting me more money. So again, unfortunately, a lot of it has to come down to the type of market you're in. And it also comes down to how reasonable the seller is, as well as how reasonable the selling agent is, because often and they're the one relaying the message to the seller when you send in that repair request. So it's going to be a little bit of a combination of the three. Now, does that mean in this current market that you're not gonna be able to get anything in the house fixed? Absolutely not. Over the last two years, all the buyers that I've helped, I was able to negotiate some type of savings for the buyer. So don't rule it out just because we're in a hot seller's market. So now let's go ahead and look at a quick example of what you might be able to expect in today's hot seller's market when you're submitting a repair request. So the way I like to break it down for my buyers is you really wanna focus on those first two categories. So category number one, health and safety. So two reasons. Obviously, you don't wanna move into a house that's unsafe or unhealthy for you and your family to live in. But the other thing is that most buyers are not going to want to move into a house that's unsafe or unhealthy either. So most sellers understand that if there's problems with health and safety, that a reasonable buyer is going to ask them to take care of it. So those are the type of things that you wanna to add to the repair request and try to get the seller to take care of. Category number two, again, the major systems of the house and again, most reasonable buyers are going to ask you to get them fixed. If all the sewer lines are backing up in the house, there's a leak in the roof, a typical buyer in today's market is still going to ask the seller to take care of that because that could be a major expense for the new buyer down the road. So now we move on to bucket number three, and this is where things get a little bit more interesting when you're submitting repair requests in today's hot sellers market. So again, remember, these are things that are usually going to be handyman jobs or small contractor jobs that might take an hour or two to get fixed. You're not talking about thousands of dollars usually. Here, you're talking about $100 there, $250 there. 
but there are a lot of them in that category, so it does add up. So you're usually going to want to get some of these addressed by the seller. You're going to have to pick and choose which ones are most important to you to get addressed to put onto that repair request. And then when you go to bucket number four in today's market, it's really hard to get any of that stuff fixed. If there's a baseboard that's chewed up, most sellers are not going to fix that for you. If there's a few scuffs on the paint, most sellers are not going to fix that for you in today's market. It's not completely unrealistic, but it's something that I typically recommend most buyers stay away from in today's market because it's cosmetic. It's not affecting the functionality of the house. You can live with it. It's not gonna harm you. And in today's market, if you start asking for too much, Oftentimes the seller gets overwhelmed. You have a list of 30 things that you want fixed and they get overwhelmed and just shut down and say, I'm not fixing anything. So I've seen that happen where you ask for too much and the seller just goes the opposite direction and just completely tells you no to everything. So those areas where it's cosmetic, don't expect to get those fixed in today's market. Can it happen? There's always a chance but it's something I recommend most buyers do not focus on when we're in a hot seller's market. So now you have that list of everything that you would like this seller to take care of for you before you feel comfortable purchasing the house. How do you go about deciding where to put that on the repair request? Do you want the seller to go ahead and take care of it during escrow? Do you wanna just get a credit for it and do it yourself at the end of escrow? It's all gonna come down to your risk tolerance as well as how willing the seller is to negotiate with you. And the reason I say risk tolerance is if you've ever watched an HDTV show about any type of renovation, you probably know by now that as soon as someone tries to fix one issue, they open up a wall, open up a can of worms, and there's 10 other issues that need to be taken care of in order for that one issue to get fixed. Maybe it was $1,000 that they thought it was gonna cost, and now you're looking at $10,000. If you're asking the seller to take care of that, all the liabilities on them. They're the ones that are going to have to pay that extra money to get everything fixed. Whereas if you're just asking for a credit, saying you'll do it yourself once escrow closes or you'll hire someone to do it yourself and they open up that wall and find the issues, now all the liabilities on you. So all those things you find in category one and category two, those are the things that I usually recommend that you put on the repair request asking the seller to take care of before escrow closes. Once you move into that category three, where it's more of the handyman stuff and things that might cost $100, $200, that's where it becomes a little bit less risky for you to ask for a credit instead. So usually it's going to be a mix of the two. You're gonna ask them to fix some of the major stuff during escrow and maybe give you a credit for some of the smaller stuff and you can handle that and pick and choose which items you wanna take care of once escrow closes. So now you've taken all those things you want repaired, you categorize them, you put them on the repair request, you signed it, now the agent is going to go to bat for you and talk to the selling agent and really convince them why all those things are so important and why it's in everybody's best interest for the seller to take care of those. Once that happens, usually a day or two later, the seller is gonna get back to you. Sometimes they might agree to everything. However, in today's market, you're usually not gonna see that to be the case. You're usually gonna see the seller come back with some type of counter offer. What I usually see in today's market is the seller is going to try to take a lot of those things off of them fixing it during escrow and instead give you some type of credit as well. So at this point, again, now it just has to go back to risk tolerance for you and what you're comfortable with. Are you okay taking on the liability of some of those bigger items that need to get fixed? If so, you and the seller might be able to come to some type of common ground and continue through escrow. However, let's say you go back and forth with the seller multiple times and you two just can't come to an agreement that you're both comfortable with. You basically have two options at this point. You can either eventually agree to whatever ultimatum the seller gave you for the repair request, or you can choose to walk away and get out of escrow and go pursue another property. If you choose walking away, there will be some financial costs involved. So usually you've paid for the inspection already. You can't get that money back. It's usually around $500. If you had any secondary inspections done, again, you're not getting that money back because it's a service that's already been performed. And then the final thing that you might be on the hook for, if you have the appraisal already ordered and performed, then again, because that service was already done, you're not going to get that money back either. And those are usually around five to $600. So again, typically you're gonna get most, if not all of your deposit back, but you could be out a thousand to $1,300 at the end of the day, if you were to back out of escrow and decide to go to a new property. So there's always a chance that you could call the seller's bluff and tell them, this is my final repair request offer. If you want to accept this, I'm walking away, I'm going to go find a new property. And you have slightly better odds if that repair request is reasonable and something that most buyers are going to ask for. However, you can't rely on it because once you get to that point 
there's no turning back. If the seller says, nope, I wanna go find a new buyer, they sign the paperwork, you can't say, oh, backsees, I wanna go ahead and get back in escrow. Yes, I agree to your repair request. I'll go ahead and continue through escrow. Once they sign it, you're out of escrow. So you have to be comfortable walking away, but you could use that as a last resort and see if maybe they're willing to say, I don't wanna go through another escrow again. I'd rather just maybe take a little bit less money than I thought I was going to get. So I don't have to put my house back on the market and go through this whole process again. So even though it's something I don't tell my buyers to bet on, it's one last strategy you can use as the last resort to try to keep yourself in escrow versus just canceling and then walking away without giving the seller a chance to respond. So I know this is a very technical and information dense episode compared to what I usually do, but I hope, especially if you're a buyer, you found this information useful, you can better understand the process of what the inspection report is used for and the steps that you take afterwards to try to get things repaired. So that way, when you get into escrow yourself, you're more comfortable with the process, you're not scared with it, and you know exactly what to expect. If you find this type of information useful, remember this is just the first video in a series of videos I plan on doing about how to buy a house in California. So if you are finding it useful and you're thinking about buying a house, please don't forget to hit that like, follow, subscribe button. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit the bell button as well below. That way you're notified every time a new episode is released. So until next week, stay happy, stay healthy, and I'll see you on the next show. Bye.